Cardiology for the Norton Health and Vas Heart and Vascular Institute. He is board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, and electrophysiology. Dr. Morris earned his medical degree from the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in Springfield and completed his internal medicine residency there. He then completed a fellowship in cardiovascular disease and clinical cardiac electrophysiology at St. Vincent Hospital, the care group in Indianapolis, Indiana. He obtained his Business of Medicine MBA at the University at the Indiana University Kelly School of Business. In addition to clinical cardiology, Dr. Morris has special interest in EP, radio frequency ablation, and pacemaker automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator. It's a mouthful. His mission is to provide the highest quality, compassionate, patient-centered care in the area of cardiovascular medicine. Dr. Morris is definitely one of our leaders in the Heart and Vascular Institute, and let's welcome him. Well, thank you, Josh, uh, for that. Uh, get my slides up here. So, uh, we're going to attempt a focused update on the clinical management of atrial fibrillation in our time here. Um, disclosure slide. So our goals today, uh, we'll cover uh, some basics of atrial fibrillation. We'll talk about prevention of heart failure or otherwise known as rate control, uh, stroke prevention, including anticoagulation management, as well as left atrial appendage management and then uh, as rhythm control for those people that do have uh, persis persistent symptoms uh, despite uh, adequate rate control. So just some basic definitions on the types of atrial fibrillation, four main types that are defined clinically at this point, paroxysmal, uh, which is basically atrial fibrillation that self terminates within a seven day period of time. Uh, and then persistent atrial fibrillation uh, for atrial fibrillation that goes on beyond seven days and up to one year. Once you've been continuously in atrial fibrillation uh, for a year or more, that is termed long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And then permanent atrial fibrillation is really a clinical designation for patients in whom further attempts to restore sinus rhythm uh, will no longer be undertaken. So, you know, the, AF, the burden of AFib is significant. Uh, it's generally uh, not a life-threatening uh, disease or rhythm condition. However, it's also not necessarily a totally benign rhythm condition either. Uh, there is roughly a five-fold uh, increase in the risk of stroke, as well as a five-fold increase in the risk of uh, developing heart failure. And we'll talk about how to prevent uh, both of those uh, complications. This uh, just shows a map uh, of the United States and uh, it's essentially a heat map for the uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, the darker the red, the higher uh, the prevalence of, of atrial fibrillation. And as you can, I'm sure see here in Louisville, uh, we are in the middle of some of the darkest uh, areas of red. Incidentally, if you were to generate a similar map with stroke rates, uh, there would be pretty significant overlay. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation does increase uh, with increasing age uh, to the point that in those in their 80-year-old uh, range, 10% uh, or more uh, prevalence of atrial fibrillation in that age category. A uh, little bit of a busy slide here, but I want to draw your attention uh, to the top left corner here, extra cardiac risk factors. So things like hypertension, sleep apnea, obesity. Uh, these are all significant risk factors for atrial fibrillation. Importantly for uh, the audience today though, these are all risk factors that are modifiable risk factors. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on how to uh, impact these risk factors in order to more successfully uh, treat uh, atrial fibrillation. Pretension was one of those. This is a, a slide showing a number of AFib studies over the years. You can, you can see that uh, anywhere from 50 up to 70% uh, 
incidence of hypertension in, in those AFib studies, so a high a coincidence of hypertension. Uh, this just demonstrates the correlation between uh, weight and atrial fibrillation. And as you can see, going from normal to overweight to obese, uh, the increasing incidence of atrial fibrillation, both in men and women. Um, in moderate to severe sleep apnea, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is roughly three times that of the general population. Uh, there's a strong increasing uh, a correlation between the increasing severity of sleep apnea and the increasing prevalence of atrial fibrillation. And in fact, studies have demonstrated that untreated sleep apnea is a significant risk factor for the recurrence of atrial fibrillation after AFib ablation. Uh, on the converse, uh, well-treated sleep apnea, uh, people tend to do uh, as well after ablation as people that, that don't have any uh, sleep apnea at all. So again, just highlighting the important importance of diagnosing uh, as well as uh, treating atrial uh, sleep apnea in this atrial fibrillation population. One more correlation, just that between AFib and heart failure. And you can see moving from left to right uh, across the uh, uh, slide, uh, increasing severity of heart failure does correlate with uh, increasing uh, prevalence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so we won't get too deep into too many studies, but uh, you know, just highlighting uh, the effect of uh, risk factor and lifestyle modification. Uh, I'll take you through this slide. This is a study in ablation, AFib ablation, and the uh, red line is the treatment group, and the blue line is the con control group. And uh, so the higher up the line is in that box, uh, the uh, higher the success rate for AFib ablation. And you can see on the, the right panel, uh, those that have had uh, one or more uh, AFib ablations, uh, the treatment group has a, a fairly high success rate and uh, pretty significantly higher than the control group. So what was the treatment group in, in this study? Well, basically it was all the people in the study were undergoing an AFib ablation, but intervention arm was risk factor modification. So uh, an intensive, essentially an intensive program to lower blood pressure, to control diabetes and glucose, to, to diagnose and treat sleep apnea, uh, as well as uh, for weight loss. And so you can see there uh, highlighting the importance uh, uh, in controlling atrial fibrillation, particularly after AFib ablation, uh, for all of these uh, various risk factors. So clinical presentation, uh, people can present with the classic palpitations. People say all kinds of things, heart racing, fluttering, pounding, skips, flip-flops. Uh, people uh, may not have that though. They may just have fatigue or feeling more tired than usual, uh, dyspnea, shortness of breath, uh, dizziness or lightheadedness. Uh, or just an inability to exercise or exercise intolerance. And then as we know, not infrequently, uh, patients can uh, present without symptoms. Uh, sometimes it's found incidentally in a physical exam with, uh, with primary care or when they show up to uh, PAT for their preoperative evaluation. So the basic clinical evaluation should of course include a history and a physical examination, a 12 lead ECG, uh, laboratory evaluation, including uh, electrolytes, blood counts, uh, thyroid uh, function at minimum. Uh, and then uh, in other patients, in some patients, Holter monitoring and or event monitoring may be needed as well as a transthoracic echo. In some patients, a stress test may be indicated. So preventing heart failure, um, a tachycardia, mediated cardiomyopathy is not an uncommon finding in patients that present initially with uncontrolled atrial fibrillation and rapid rates. In fact, there's study data to, to show this. Uh, here you see in this panel, uh, on the left-hand side of the panel, initial diagnosis, atrial fibrillation with heart rates 120s and above, and the median ejection fraction in, the, in this group was 25%. Uh, 
ranging from as low as almost 10% up to just over 30%. With just achieving rate control uh, at follow-up, the median ejection fraction improved to 52% with a range of around 40 to, to almost 60%. Uh, so I think this highlights and demonstrates the importance of, of rate control uh, in this group. So uh, what do we use for rate control? In most people, the first line agent would be beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. If uh, inadequate rate control with one of these agents, uh, then often digoxin is as good as a second line agent or one of the other drugs that you haven't used yet. Uh, there are certain conditions uh, which would make you think about a, uh, one over the other. Uh, for example, patients with heart failure, uh, beta blockers would be indicated and calcium blockers uh, may be relatively contraindicated. Uh, patients uh, generally should not have digoxin as their only uh, rate controlling medication unless they're relatively sedentary or otherwise their blood pressure, blood pressure would not tolerate uh, the other medications. So what is considered adequate rate control? So there've been a number of studies uh, that have looked at this, either rest and activity rates or just overall rates. Uh, but I think that uh, there's uh, some relatively uh, general agreement that somewhere around uh, 80 beats per minute uh, rest or 110 to 115 uh, beats per minute with uh, light to moderate uh, exercise, it, it would be acceptable. The uh, risk of a tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy does start to go up significantly as the average rates overall climb above 100 beats per minute. So AFFIRM is a study that uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of. It's been around for a little bit now. Uh, and this basically co uh, compared rate versus rhythm control. And uh, somewhat surprising to uh, many of us at the time, it showed that uh, really there was no statistical difference between rate and rhythm control, which I think led a lot of people to say, well, we should just rate control everyone. Uh, I think a, a couple of comments on a firm, you know, it's important whether it's a firm or any other study to make sure that your patient uh, relatively matches the patient population of the study that, that you're extrapolating the data from. And so in a firm, this was a relatively older patient population. I believe the average age was uh, above 70. And in, in a firm, uh, there were largely patients uh, that had well tolerated atrial fibrillation, meaning uh, once their rates were controlled, uh, they had uh, minimal or no symptoms. So uh, I don't think a firm adequately addresses uh, what to do with patients that are symptomatic uh, despite adequate rate control. And I don't think that a firm adequately addresses uh, what to do with patients with heart failure. However, it does suggest that in an older patient population that has well-controlled atrial fibrillation and minimal or no symptoms that those people will do reasonably well over time. Of course, assuming that we have addressed anticoagulation. So how do we confirm rate control? Well, of, of course, the, the most common is a resting ECG. Uh, however, there are times that you may need to use other methods uh, that would include a 24-hour Holter monitor uh, a stress test, uh, or at times extended Holter monitoring for up to, uh, for up to 14 days. Uh, some of the advantages of some of these methods, other than just arresting ECG, it allows you to evaluate uh, heart rate control uh, when the patient is active in their own natural environment, as opposed to sitting or laying at rest, and gives you a better sense of the effectiveness of your rate control regimen as well as uh, identifying those patients and who, and where there is adequate rate control at rest, uh, but are symptomatic with activity and have rapid rates, primarily uh, gesturing activity. 
So uh, stroke prevention is, is key once we uh, have gotten the rates controlled and uh, make sure they're not in heart failure. Uh, the next thing we wanna turn our attention to is preventing strokes. As we noted, AF uh, brings with it roughly a five-fold increase in the risk for stroke. Uh, of course, stroke in atrial fibrillation is primarily uh, the result of cardiogenic, cardiogenic embolism. Uh, blood can pool in the left atrium, particularly in the left atrial append appendage. A blood clot can form, and that blood clot could uh, break off and cause a stroke or systemic embolism. So every patient with atrial fibrillation uh, should be assessed and risk stratified to see if they should be on anticoagulation. And uh, I wanna emphasize here that the decision on anticoagulation really and truly should be uh, a separate decision from whether you're going to treat them with rate control or rhythm control. So how do we decide who needs anticoagulation? Well, uh, according to the most recent uh, AFib guidelines by the ACC and HRS, which are pro professional societies, uh, the chads vask score, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with at this point, is the preferred method for risk stratification. You can see on the left panel uh, the, the various factors. Uh, so C is for congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, uh, A, A for age, D for diabetes, V for uh, vascular disease, and that's uh, coronary or peripheral vascular disease, uh, stroke, TIA or systemic embolism. And then on the right panel uh, uh, shows the number of points correlating with uh, the stroke rate. And so for example, uh, with a CHADS FASC score of five, uh, the stroke rate is 6.7% per year. Again, that's a per year rate, not a lifetime stroke rate. And that's important to uh, discuss with patients if you're gonna have this discussion 1% or 2%, you know, may not seem like a big number. Uh, and then uh, until you put it into the perspective of, of that being a yearly uh, stroke risk. Uh, I just put this slide in here uh, to, to remind you all that sometimes it is useful to use your peripheral brain. Uh, if you're not doing this every day, uh, this is a, an app that uh, my former partner, David Mann, had written, who is an EP physician, and you check off the boxes and it spits out the uh, corresponding score as well as the uh, annual stroke rate. Uh, and these, these sorts of things can be, can be helpful reference tools as I'm sure many of you use. So what is the recommendation? So for uh, men with a CHADS VAS score of zero and women with a CHADS VAS score of one, it is, quote, reasonable to omit oral anticoagulation uh, because the risk of bleeding, uh, you know, largely equals out the reduction in the that, uh, risk of stroke. For men with a score of one and women with a score of two, uh, anticoagulation may be considered. And then when we get to uh, men with a score of two and women with a score of three, anticoagulation uh, is recommended. Of course, the uh, options for anticoagulation, the most recent guidelines, uh, AFib guidelines suggest that no acts in uh, most situations are the preferred uh, uh, mode of anticoagulation. Uh, warfarin, however, is uh, still an option as well. Uh, this just demonstrates the importance of keeping patients within the therapeutic range. And that generally is two to three uh, in most AFib patients. And you can see uh, the data to back this up. Once the INR gets to 1.9 and below, the risk of stroke starts to go up fairly steeply. Uh, and then on the high side, once the uh, INR climbs above about 3.9 to four, uh, the risk of uh, bleeding does start to uh, increase uh, fairly rapidly as well. There are uh, certain considerations uh, to take into account. Generally, patients with mechanical valves uh, should not uh, be treated with NOACs. Uh, patients with valvular AF, that being defined as moderate or more mitral stenosis, uh, also should not be on NOACs. Those patients should uh, be on warfarin. 
uh, if there's renal insufficiency or chronic kidney disease, uh, you should be take care to make sure that uh, uh, if the dose is adjusted if it needs to be. And in patients with end-stage renal disease or on hemodialysis, your uh, choices should be limited to warfarin or apixaban. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, in patients with coronary artery disease, as well as, well as prior stents, uh, you, uh, basically the goal is to uh, uh, minimize the period of triple anticoagulant therapy, that being uh, oral anticoagulation plus dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, we, I coordinate uh, quite frequently with my interventional colleagues uh, to come up with the best plan of, of care uh, for these patients. And this is primarily an issue uh, early after stent implantation. And then patients for, that have labile or uh, INRs or issues with uh, uh, compliance on, on getting the INR checked, uh, NOACs uh, should at least be considered. So despite warfarin having been around for uh, quite a long time and uh, having several options uh, as far as the newer oral anticoagulants that uh, are in some cases significantly more convenient, uh, the rates of anticoagulation in appropriate patients with a high CHADS FAST score and no contraindications still tops out around 50% or so. So, uh, you know, we still have a lot of work to do in this arena. I'll make a note here as well. You see there's a significant number of patients that are on aspirin only or aspirin monotherapy. I mean, this may be 20% in some situations. And this is in not in the lower risk patients, but actually in the, the higher CHADS fast score patients. And you know, this really is not adequate therapy. In the most recent AFib guidelines, uh, aspirin really has minimal to no role in treating atrial fibrillation. Uh, it really comes down to a decision about uh, the patient being on oral anticoagulation or not. And, and so the risk of, of bleeding versus the risk of stroke on oral anticoagulation. So we still have some pretty significant work to do here to uh, reduce the risk of stroke in, in atrial fibrillation. So speaking of those patients that are not on oral anticoagulation, some people uh, do have reasons. Uh, they may have a high stroke risk, but they may have had uh, issues with bleeding or other reasons that, that they're not great uh, candidates for long-term anticoagulation. This is the patient of population, this is a patient population where uh, left atrial appendage management comes into play. As we mentioned earlier, the left atrial appendage is the primary source of uh, a thrombus and atrial fibrillation. There's several different approaches. The two percutaneous approaches, currently the only FDA approved in the cardiac uh, left atrial occlusion device is the Watchman procedure. Uh, which we do offer here at Norton Heart and Vascular. There's also an epicardial uh, approach uh, that some institutions are using called the Lariat. And then from a surgical standpoint, if it's an open surgical procedure such as bypass, there's suture ligation, stapling, or uh, even complete excision of the atrial appendage. And then from a thoracoscopic approach, there's a device called the Atriclip. Uh, and we offer all of those uh, surgical approaches uh, here at Norton Heart and Vascular as well. So this is a cartoon picture of the Watchman device. Uh, it's a night and all frame device that is uh, self-expanding and has a, a PET membrane uh, with uh, a number of different sizes. The implant procedure is done under general anesthesia uh, in the cath lab by either an EP or an inter interventional cardiologist and under uh, fluoroscopic and echo uh, guidance. And uh, it's a one-time implant procedure. The patient does need to remain on anticoagulation for about 45 days after the implant procedure. Uh, after that initial 45 days, uh, a TE is 
repeat it again to ensure that there's adequate position and seal and uh, roughly 95% of people or more are able to stop their anticoagulation at that point. <clears throat> Just a, a busy slide here, but I do wanna highlight a couple of things. Uh, if you can see my cursor, if you can, this is comparing Watchman on the left and Warfarin on the right. Uh, and if you look at all stroke or systemic embolism, roughly equivalent. If you look at the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, roughly an 80% reduction in hemorrhagic strokes with the Watchman device. Uh, if you look at major bleeding, roughly a 50% reduction in major bleeding with the Watchman device. And if you look at all-cause mortality, uh, uh, roughly a 27% uh, reduction in all-cause mortality with the Watchman device. Uh, so the take home from this is the Watchman device from the standpoint of stroke prevention is, is, a, is equivalent to warfarin uh, in, pre, in preventing uh, strokes, uh, but the bleeding risk is significantly less. Uh, briefly on the bottom panel, just to highlight that fact, this dashed blue line shows uh, ischemic stroke risk and untreated atrial fibrillation. The solid red line shows ischemic stroke risk with uh, atrial fibrillation treated with warfarin, and then the triangle points uh, show the stroke risk uh, corresponding with Chad's VASC score in the various uh, Watchman studies. And you can see that uh, the Watchman studies do uh, roughly uh, correlate with uh, the warfarin data. So what about the patient that is adequately rate controlled, is on appropriately, appropriate anticoagulation and still continues to have symptoms? could be palpitations, it could be exertional dyspnea, fatigue. So those are the patients that we would think about rhythm control. Uh, this is a fairly um, complex flow chart that we won't spend much time on today, but this is the guideline uh, algorithm on how to select antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Of course, we do a lot of this in, in the AFib clinic. The one point I would like to make on this slide if you look at patients that have no heart disease, amiodarone is not a first-line therapy. Again, I repeat, amiodarone is not a first-line therapy for those on with no or minimal heart disease. Um, and that's for long-term management. There may be instances where, this, where you would use it short-term. So there are some instances that, of course, uh, you would want to pursue acute rhythm control or acute cardioversion. And that's for those patients that present with acute hemodynamic compromise, hypotension, or other symptoms related to that. Symptoms or signs of ischemia. Patients that are in acute heart failure or pulmonary edema. And then uh, so-called so pre-excited AFib or rapid atrial fibrillation over an accessory pathway. So uh, non-pharmacologic options for rhythm control include ablation. This will take you back to your days uh, studying Netter. This is a cartoon picture of the left atrium and the four, four pulmonary veins. This picture is important because of this study uh, completed in 1998. Uh, and what they did basically was map the triggers of atrial fibrillation. And as, as they mapped those triggers, uh, the majority of triggers for atrial fibrillation map to one of the four pulmonary veins, one or more of the four pulmonary veins. So this quickly became the basis for ablation and atrial fibrillation. These are pictures that I look at on a pretty regular basis. This is a, a, a snapshot from the 3D electroanatomic mapping system uh, that we use in the EP lab. This is a map, an actual map of an actual left atrium that was created uh, this uh, circle here is a, a catheter, uh, along with this, uh, here is the ablation catheter. And uh, this shows uh, the chaotic electrical activity in the left atrium. And the ablation lesions around uh, the pulmonary veins. And uh, again, without spending time, you can see how now it's a nice, normal, regular rhythm and uh, silent electrical activity in the pulmonary veins. And so uh, isolating uh, those triggers 